Welcome to church. I'm so glad you could join us today. I'm Brandon. I'm part of the live stream team here at Calvary. If this is your first time joining us, we'd love to get to know you and answer any questions you might have. Simply text HELLO to 587-323-1199 or message us on Facebook and Instagram and we'll reply right back. Thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the service. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Bev Sessink, Associate Pastor here at Calvary Community Church, and we want to thank every one of you for joining us in person and those of you online as well. If you're new to our church, we would love to meet you. The opportunity to do so in person or by text, email, or however, we want to say welcome with us today. We're entering the third week of our 21 days of prayer, and this morning I'm going to be looking at a specific passage in Scripture where the Israelite people were praying and fasting seeking God's will. That passage from the Old Testament is from Isaiah 58, and we're going to interact with it in three sections today and discern its application for our lives together and individually as well. And so I would ask you, and I'm going to tell you what the, the name of our sermon is today, I'm going to ask you to actually repeat it, but I'll say it once, and I'll say it in the way I'd like you to say it, and that is fasting. Are you serious? Would you say that with me? Fasting, are you serious? I do hope you are serious about fasting. And this morning, a little bit of background to uh, uh, the story of Isaiah, the prophet. He was chosen by God to give a message to the people, a prophecy to them. He was speaking to them in the 8th century BC, and it, he was speaking to a nation that had turned its back on God. And instead of loving God and having a humility and heart for him and for others, they had become indifferent to him. They had, so to speak, closed their ears to him and were committing injustices amongst each other and others as well. They turned their backs, but God in his mercy didn't turn his back on them. He was calling out to them through the prophet Isaiah to return to him, that his blessing would be upon him, upon them and through them to others as well. And so that, with that in mind, we're going to start with God's complaint to the Israelites found in verses 1 to 5 of Isaiah 58, read by my wife Mandy. Shout with the voice of a trumpet blast. Shout aloud. Don't be timid. Tell my people Israel of their sins. Yet they act so pious. They come to the temple every day and seem delighted to learn all about me. They act like a righteous nation that would never abandon the laws of its God. They ask me to take action on their behalf, pretending they want to be near me. We have fasted before you, they say. Why aren't you impressed? We have been very hard on ourselves, and you don't even notice it. I will tell you why, I respond. It is because you are fasting to please yourselves. Even while you fast, you keep oppressing your workers. What good is fasting when you keep on fighting and quarreling? This kind of fasting will never get you anywhere with me. You humble yourselves by going through the motions of penance, bowing your heads like reeds bending in the wind, you dress in burlap and cover yourselves with ashes. And so we have the complaint that God gives to the people, and he speaks it loudly through the prophet. He begins with verses and phrases like, they come to the temple every day, they seem delighted to learn all about me, and they want to be near me. This gives us three purposes for fasting, directions that you and I can take in the fast that I hope many of us are on as part of our 21 days of prayer. First, a fast is to seek to know God so that we can follow his commands. Because God is not always easily understood because his ways so often are above and beyond ours. And he wants us to discover those. He wants us to know him and what his will is for us and others. And one way we can seek understanding about what God has said and who he is, is by fasting. Fasting, prayer, 
And the reading of God's word combined is able to give us insights and understanding to God himself and what he desires for us and through us. And second, we fast also to make wise decisions. Our lives are all filled with monumental decisions. Do we take that job? Do we move? Do we get married? And if so, to whom? Do we start a business or not? Rent or buy? Listen or ignore? Do we retire or keep on working? Do we change doctors or get a second opinion? Do we have surgery or treatment? Or perhaps not. I think of a number of years ago where we as elders were faced with a major challenge. And so we chose for 21 days to fast and pray and seek God's will because we needed an answer to the specific situation. And miracle of miracles on the 22nd day, God answered decisively and clearly. And to my memory, I've never as a pastor experienced a more clear answer, a more decisive response to the willingness of our leaders to take 21 days to fast and pray to discern, to discover, and to do God's will. And so there are many decisions that each of us need to make in life. And God doesn't want us to do this on our own. He wants us to ask of him for wisdom, for understanding, for insight. And this is gained through prayer, through fasting, and taking his word and applying it to our situation. And third, we also want a sense of closeness or connection to God. I think at times all of us have the experience of somehow feeling far from God. And that may feel like a valley. And sometimes it's like a mountaintop. We feel connected to God. And God wants us to continue to seek him so that we can experience his presence in the valleys, the difficult times, and in the mountaintop experiences as well. Because he wants us to be in relationship with him. And as we know, there's an ebb and flow in relationships that we have with each other. Sometimes it's stronger, sometimes it's a bit weaker, and sometimes that is as well in our relationship with God. But by seeking him, by seeking to know his will, and seeking to please him, we can discover a closer intimacy when we do that on a regular basis. Now, the Israelites were fasting. So, well, what was the problem? Why did God have to give them a warning through the prophet Isaiah? Why was he displeased? Well, it would seem as though the people were actually displeased going through the motions. This is what we do at certain times of the, of the Jewish calendar. And so they were doing that, but their heart wasn't really there. Have you perhaps ever been there where you're going through the motions in whatever situation, but you, you know your heart is, is not where, where it ought to be? That's where we need to call out and seek God because God wants us to be in that close connection with him. And so the fasting that the people were engaged in was not actually the fast that God wanted. What was this complaint? Well, first in verse 3, during their fast, they did as they pleased. They apparently took advantage of other people, those right around them. It says that they were mistreating people, even people that, who were employed by them. And then second, in verse 4, during their fast, it turns out that they were arguing and angry and bitter. In other words, they were hangry. Have you ever heard the word hangry before? I'll explain a little bit more what hangry means, but I think you have an idea. So while they were fasting, at the same time they were mistreating other people. They were not acting in a way that would honor God. And then in verse 5, when God asked why they were fasting, as we've already seen, he discovered that they, while they were wanting decisions from God, while they were wanting insight from God, a lot of it was about them. What would I get? What would be my benefit? Rather than the question, what God do you want? How can I serve you? How can I please you? A moment ago, I mentioned the word hangry. And you may have not heard that word before. Actually, I didn't until now. And that is from, the, that is from two words together. Any idea? That's right, hungry and angry. And doesn't that happen sometimes when we fast? we start to feel a little bit irritable, a little bit frustrated, a little bit like, oh, I just would love to have that piece of whatever. It's, I, I think that happened this week too. I re, which day, I don't remember, but I was thinking, oh, I, I'd love to, I think, have a, a coffee or go to Tim Hortons, and I'm going, oh, no, I can't. But you know, that was good. 
It was, a, it was a choice to sacrifice, saying, God, this day I'm not going to do that to honor you. And, and I hope all of us uh, have been participating in this 21 days of prayer because it's different than what we've done in the past. And yet it challenges different areas where perhaps uh, we're a bit too comfortable, whether it's in our spending habits or our eating habits or whatever that may be. Yes, the action and the attitudes of the Jewish people were not lining up with the heart of God, and he was challenging them about that. And if you would say with me again the title of our sermon, and say it with gusto, fasting, are you serious? And, that, and what was God's response to their fast? Well, he let them know that he had a complaint, and then he shares his concern with them as to what he wanted from them in Isaiah 58, verses 6 and 7. No, this is the kind of fasting I want. Free those who are wrongly imprisoned. Lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free and remove the chains that bind people. Share your food with the hungry and give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them and do not hide from relatives who need your help. I believe this sounds strangely familiar to what Jesus said in Luke, said in chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And just as the prophet Isaiah was speaking to the people of Israel, calling them for justice, and for hope. Likewise, Jesus is calling each and every one of us to bring healing and hope into our broken world. God loves people, period. And he invites us, you and I, to practically love people with his love in and through us, because this is part of the good news of the kingdom of God. And so in Isaiah 58, he brings out a whole different aspect of fasting that we do not normally consider. Yes, fasting is for us to focus on in prayer to understand God. Fasting is also used so that God can give us direction in our decisions. And fasting is also meant to help us grow spiritually closer to God. But fasting is also meant to grow compassion within each and every one of us because fasting needs to be accompanied with an obedient life, a life committed to God, where our outside reflects the inside, where the two are the same. God wants us not simply to deny ourselves of food. He wants us to do far more than that. He wants us to give ourselves to him that he can accomplish his good work in us and through us. In the text we just read, there were specific things that God wanted to do through the Israelites, and that was freeing those oppressed and enslaved, easing the burden of employees, feeding the hungry and providing shelter for the homeless, giving clothing to those in need, and helping their relatives and family. And all of these have a root in compassion and God's concern for people. Because when fasting, when done properly, should produce within us a compassion for people who are hurting. Compassion is pity, sympathy, empathy, care, concern, sensitivity, warmth, love mercy, kindness, and so on. Compassion is all those feelings, but most importantly, compassion is putting those feelings into action. Matthew 9, verse 36 tells us about Jesus, that when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And in Matthew 14, verse 14, he says, Jesus saw a large crowd and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. And so we see Jesus was a man of compassion. And when we're filled with compassion for others, we are so much like Jesus. Fasting should grow compassion in us for others so that we can share what he has given to us and through us. Now, many people ask this question but don't have the answer. What is God's purpose for my life? Why am I here? The answer is that God wants you to touch other people with his love. Looking after people 
and whatever their need, it's not an option for those who are followers of Jesus Christ. And if we go through all the religious practices and all the things that make us seemingly look good, but we don't have a heart of concern for others, we've missed the heart of God. It's clear that people will continue to be in need around our world. So the challenge is, the question is, how should we as Christians respond to this need? Some of you perhaps may be thinking right now, well, what can we do? We've only got so much resources and so much time, and money won't necessarily solve all the problems of the world anyways. It's too difficult. I don't even feel like doing anything. And perhaps that's all too common of an attitude amongst many people, perhaps even some of us here. But I want you to hear that God is not asking you to be the solution to every problem in this world. That would be unrealistic, but he is asking each of us to be part of the solution. I think everyone at some times asks the questions, what can one person do? What can I do? What can we do? Well, not much by yourself, but everyone working together can make a difference. You have a part to play in the solution of making a difference. And what will your part be? It's a little bit like the story of the boy you may have heard who was at the beach and the, uh, the, the tide had brought in a lot of these starfish and the little boy looks at the, star, at the starfish and he takes it, he throws it back into the water. And then a fellow happens to walk by and he says, don't you realize there's hundreds of starfish here? You know, you, you, can't, you can't help them all. And the little boy looks at him and says, well, I guess I can help this one. And he takes another starfish and throws that into the water as well. What Jesus is saying and what Isaiah is saying is that the point of life and living is that we're called to be a blessing to someone else. As followers of Jesus Christ, we are called to imitate him. And the way we do that is by acting for the well-being of others. One person at a time, one instance at a time, one opportunity at a time. So how do we do that? Well, here are some ideas that you may wish to consider. Freeing those who are oppressed and enslaved. Right here in our Millwoods community, we have a number of young people, teens, who are desperately needing to be parented, needing to be fathered, and needing to be cared for. And we are thankful that we can work with such organizations as Youth Alive and Youth Unlimited to be able to help reach those individuals. Now, you might be saying, I'm really not too keen to get involved with teens. They're so different fr from, from me and when I was raised. Well, a lot of these organizations need a lot of people behind the scenes, perhaps not to necessarily be in directly involved, but to be able to make a difference in the lives of these precious people here in our community. During the month of December, we had something called December, uh, remembering men and women who have been involved, unfortunately, in the sex trade, the slave trade. They have been oppressed. They have been enslaved. And this was an opportunity to remind us that we can have a part in their freedom and their healing as well. And right now in our own community, I don't know if you know, but the largest uh, home for, for uh, I should say, sorry, the largest women's shelter in our province is right here in our community where they're needing volunteers to help serve these, these single moms and these children who have experienced domestic abuse and violence. And further afield, there's other opportunities too, such as the Billy Graham Association, Association 100 Huntley Street, the Prison Fellowship, the Voice of the Martyrs, and numerous other organizations that are needing people to make a difference in the lives of others. With the Billy Graham Association, there's people who are online asking to know about Jesus. And they're needing people to be able to interact with them. Or we have the voice of the martyrs. Many brothers and sisters in Christ are in prison right now. And they need letters written to them to encourage them. And then there's the opportunities are just so numerous. So many opportunities where we can make a difference in the lives of others. Also, there's the easing the burden of employees. If you are an employer, you can fulfill your responsibility and privilege by treating your employees like you yourself want to be treated, giving them appropriate wages, reasonable hours of service, benefits, and other things that helps them to feel appreciated for the work they do. And if you're an employee, likewise, you should treat your employer the way that you would want to be treated. 
giving proper service for the, for the wages you receive. And also together with fellow employees, doing your best at the workplace and also caring for fellow employees in the midst of distress, especially at a time like this during COVID-19, because so many people are finding themselves distressed. Just briefly, I think people who are, I'll talk about it later, so I'll leave that for now. Next is feeding the hungry and providing shelter for the homeless. Now here in Edmonton, there's lots of opportunities for this. There's the Edmonton Food Bank, where they receive food and where they need to distribute it. And they need volunteers to help them with that. And here at Calvary, I'm very thankful that we too have a food bank, where 2% of all the offering that comes to the church goes toward that, plus anything else that people bring. And this is a tremendous opportunity to help people in our community who are struggling just to meet their daily needs. But beyond that, there's also the Mustard Seed, Hope Mission, Boyle Street Cooperative, and other agencies that, are, again, are needing Christians who are willing to say, I want to help in some way, maybe for just a couple hours a week, but helping to just lighten the load of those who work full-time and part-time trying to meet those needs. And I would say, don't necessarily feel that you need to volunteer in a Christian organization. If you think back to the Fort McMurray fire, I volunteered along with quite a number of people to help uh, sort out all kinds of things that came in, all kinds of supplies. The team I was on, I was not even aware one of them were Christians, but that did not stop us from serving those in need. And then there is giving clothes to those in need. And here in Millwood, and let alone throughout our city, there are a number of clothing banks where people can have clothing given to them. And regularly, I'm very thankful that we too have a clothing bank where individuals and couples and families can come to have their needs met. It's a privilege to be able to serve people with what we have received. And so we always are thankful for clean, well-kept uh, clothing that can meet the needs because so often people are feeling under pressure because how do I even look presentable when I have so little clothes? Or sometimes people are, are going to be going to a job interview and they have nothing that they think is presentable. So often we've been able to provide something that's made a difference and hopefully they would then be able to get an empl employment in part because of our part that we've played. And then there is helping your family and relatives. And this is a big one because in Canada we're quite individualistic, aren't we? A lot of it is about me, myself, and I. And as a result, many people feel isolated, especially when there's family not nearby or family that is not in good relationship. Uh, many times, as part of the Benevolent Fund, when I'm talking with people, I hear either that family is so distant that they don't have connection, or family is way too close and there's so much conflict, and it adds so much stress uh, to them. And so I have the privilege representing you, and I want to say thank you again for your support of our ministry at Calvary because it makes it possible for us to spend time with people from our community, from different faith groups, from no faith necessarily, and be able to hear them and help them and make a difference in their lives. And I was just recently talking with another group of volunteers from another organization, and they were giving food out, and I said, that's so good. And I said, also, a lot of times, people just need to be heard. And they said, yes, that's really good that your church can do that, that you're willing to set aside time and resources and personnel to spend time letting people share the stories of their heart, often which are very difficult and painful. So we have unique opportunities. We have lots of opportunities to make a difference in the lives of other people. Several years ago, a Muslim friend of mine said, Bev, you're my friend. In fact, he said, you're my brother. And I, my brother, well, we're of different faiths. How could this be? And so in my mind, I was thinking, how is this? And then I thought, well, while we may not be brothers of the same faith, we are brothers in our common humanity because we were all created by God. And so because of that, I began to have a change in my thinking that it's not us and them, it's us together as the family of creation whom God has created. And so I would like you to think a little bit bigger than just immediate family or just even extended family, but how about extending your idea of family a bit broader to people who aren't blood relatives, but people who need to feel loved and cared for. 
people whom you would visit in their homes or would visit in your home because many of us are hesitant to do that even before COVID. Now one day, I believe that COVID-19 will be something in the past. And when that time comes, it's an opportunity for us to do that which Jesus called us to do, to treat others the way we'd want to be treated, to visit people in their homes. Maybe they're immigrants, maybe they're single moms, maybe they're people at the, uh, at the Grey Nuns, extended care, or wherever it may be, or inviting people to come and visit us, maybe after a Sunday service, instead of rushing on home, we say, why don't you come on over? We'll have a meal together. It's something that we need to do more and more because this is not part of our uh, Canadian culture, but it is an opportunity to express the love of God, the compassion that he has for all of us. And if we look at the early church, the early church exemplified what God wanted, that they were actively involved in serving their community and they were recognized as making a difference in spite of the fact that the Roman culture did not want anything to do with Christianity and yet they saw the Christians acting in a way that draw, drew them. And so if you would say with me again the title of our sermon and with gusto, fasting, are you serious? I would now like to invite my wife, Mandy, to come, and she's going to share with us from Matthew chapter, or I should say, uh, Isaiah. No, sorry, it is Matthew 25. Matthew 25, 31 to 36 in verses 40. And again, true fasting will change your heart and make it compassionate. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in his presence and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. I'm a broken, recovering drug addict that got a second chance. And uh, I love the poor because I know I'm the poor. And as long as I breathe, I'll serve the poor. You all need to push for plenty. You see all these people, they have children. Hungry children. We need social distancing or are we going to get in trouble? Politicians say that it was a level of this coronavirus. It's a lie because if you're poor, you've got no chance. There's tuna pasta bacon all sorts in here. People are coming down here for hot food that they can eat now. It's really hard to get food for myself because I've got much money on me and I can't go out anywhere. A couple of days food is been everything to us. The need's massive, absolutely colossal. We'll have no sidekicks. I suffer from depression and this coronavirus has made it ten times worse. If it hadn't been for all these, basically be dead. You've seen people who are working that can't make ends meet. Every time you get any money, it disappears as fast as you've got it. You, the bills swallow it up. With the coronavirus as well, with the reduction in wages, it's not easy to cope. So this means you can eat? Yes, yeah, you can eat and it helps out wherever you're stuck. I think they've all got chocolate here, brother. Tonight, some of these guys are sleeping on the concrete. This is the church I represent. In Matthew 25, we see Jesus' emphasis on the poor, the hungry, the prisoner. And he says that when the people serve the poor, the hungry and prisoner, and help them, they were serving him. Jesus identifies himself with the poor and those in need. In essence, he is saying, if you want to serve me, here I am, come and find me. 
I am a refugee. I am a prisoner. I am the poor and the needy. Do you want to serve Jesus? Do you wish you could do something for God? You can go and find him. He is waiting at the mustard seed, at Kids Cottage, at Hope Mission, at many places in our city and in our churches. He is waiting for you to come. He is a family you give room to, to live in your home. He is a broken whose tears you dry. He is not far away, but he is very near. He is a child you take care of who is in need. He, Jesus, became the naked, the thirsty, and the poor as he hung on the cross for us. He embraced our poverty so we could be rich in his grace and love for others. He embraced our nakedness and our shame so we could receive his robes of righteousness. He became the poor, and we are the poor. It is not an us and them. We are not just doing our good deeds. We are only doing what is most precious, serving our master. And so, are you ashamed of him? Do you want no one to think the poor is your brother or your sister, so you won't sit with them in the restaurant after you buy them a meal? Or do you embrace them, knowing they reflect in his eyes and back to you, your own humanity? And maybe the discomfort we feel is because we don't want to see and recognize that this too is us and that all we have and are has been given to us so that we can serve him. I attended a suicide intervention training pre-COVID. There were many people in ministry attending as well as people from social service and other organizations. During the training, we had to pair up with the person beside us. There was a dear older man taking the training who had a serious condition, a skin condition that he was born with that could take his life eventually. He was a bit awkward socially, but all he had ever wanted was a family. I watched as people shied away from him. He was across the room from me, so instead of pairing up, I hung back. I deliberately waited to see what would happen to him. No one beside him turned to him. As soon as the instructor asked who would go with him, I offered. We had to model a suicide intervention in essence, he really wanted to tell his story of loneliness and longing for a family in the role play. And I had to role play an intervention. It was a very touching role play, as it was anchored in his reality, and I knew that. And it was important to me to uphold his dignity and story during the role play. Afterwards, I felt sad as I reflected upon my experience and as I thought of all those people taking the training, yet rejecting a fellow classmate in need. For many people, this is what suicide is about, loneliness. It seemed so ironic. That day I learned from a dear man, but I also felt that I touched the heart of Jesus. And if the Israelites obeyed God's direction, what would be his response? He would pour out his blessings on them, as it says in Isaiah 58, verse 8 to 14. 
Then your salvation will come like the dawn and your wounds will quickly heal. Your godliness will lead you forward and the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. Then when you call, the Lord will answer, yes, I am here. He will quickly reply. Remove the heavy yoke of oppression. Stop pointing your finger and spreading vicious rumors. Feed the hungry and help those in trouble. Then your light will shine out from the darkness and the darkness around you will be as bright as noon. The Lord will guide you continually, giving you water when you are dry and restoring your strength. You will be like a well-watered garden, like an overflowing spring. Some of you will rebuild the deserted ruins of your cities. Then you will be known as a rebuilder of walls and a restorer of homes. Keep the Sabbath day holy. Don't pursue your own interests on that day, but enjoy the Sabbath. And speak of it with delight as the Lord's holy day. Honor the Sabbath in everything you do on that day. And don't follow your own desires or talk idly. Then the Lord will be your delight. I will give you great honor and satisfy you with the inheritance I promised to your ancestor, Jacob. I, the Lord, have spoken. Isn't it interesting that the list of God's blessings on the Israelites is far greater than what his expectations were of them? God has described for us the kind of fast that he approves of. The kind of fast that God approves is one where we seek to understand him and his purposes in making decisions and drawing close to him because that in turn will change our hearts, a heart of compassion, a compassion that impacts those around us. In fact, of those blessings that were listed, there's actually 11 of them that were mentioned, 11 extraordinary blessings. Do we wish to be blessed by God? Do we want his favor in our lives? Do we want to be close to him? These 11 blessings to me are a little bit like uh, the sunrise early in the morning when you just see it coming up and you go, wow, this is the blessing that God wants to give. And you know, in the midst of COVID-19, we can feel easily overwhelmed. But does that prevent us from still reaching out to others? And however that might be. And just as the Israelites were offered God's blessing in their lives, if they obeyed, I believe that likewise, each one of us and us together at Calvary Community Church can make a difference and choose to be a blessing in people's lives individually and people's lives together as God directs us. And so according to Isaiah 58, verses 8 to 14, we can anticipate these following blessings. And I'd love to take more time, but we're short of time today. But I just want to repeat these blessings that we would know what God offers to us as his children if we will willingly respond to him. And that is, blessings will occur in our lives. Healing will happen in our lives. God will lead us. God will guard and protect us. God will hear our prayers. God will guide us. God will provide for us. God will give us strength to face each day. Our lives and relationships will be repaired and restored. Joy will be found in the Lord, and he will overcome difficulties or, and obstacles for us. And one last time, if you would say with me the title of our sermon, Fasting. Are you serious? As we come to the end of today's presentation, may I ask, where are you in your relationship with God? Is it your desire to know him, to grow closer to him, to understand him? Whether you are presently participating in our 21 days of prayer, is it your desire to know and do God's will and to grow in compassion for other people? If that does not presently describe you, I would encourage you to consider fasting, seeking God that you may discover, that you may know, that you may experience his purposes and plan for your life. And if, you're not specific, if you have not specifically asked God into your life, I would invite you to talk to God, to pray a short prayer with me, asking him to come into your life, to change your heart, and for you to become like him. 
And if you would wish, you could say this after me. God, today I realize I'm not living this life that I've heard about you, heard about today. I need you to come into my life and change me from the inside out. I'm not sure how to begin, but I ask you to do this so that I too can become the person you want me to be and that I want to be as I invite you to change me to become like you. Amen. If you've prayed that prayer today, I would encourage you to text LIFE at 587-323-1199. And we will reply to you about next steps on your spiritual journey. In conclusion, I would ask you to consider and discern your response to today's presentation and decide what you will do to live out this kind of life that God has called us to live. If you have any questions about today's sermon or anything else for that matter, our staff is here to serve you. Whether you're here in person or those of you who are online, we want to be able to interact, to encourage, and to help each other on this journey that we're on. For those of you online, you can connect with us at our Calvary Community Church Facebook page or also at calvarycommunity.ca uh, backslash uh, live. And then if you go to the uh, bottom right corner, you can share a prayer request or any other thoughts you have. And as we conclude today, let us watch the sermon based on Isaiah 58.
Let's pray together. We thank you, O Lord, for your word to us today through the prophet Isaiah, that we, like the Israelites, are called to demonstrate the compassion and care of our God, who has cared deeply for us and who has called us to care for others. I pray for each of us for wisdom to know what you would have us to do and a willingness and a way, O Lord, to discover where we can make the difference in the life of one person or one couple or one family or whoever that might be, that they would experience the compassion, care, and love of God through us, your children. We pray this giving thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. If you have any questions or you need assistance, don't hesitate to contact us. You can find more information on our website. And as always, you can join us live on Sundays at 10 a.m. on Facebook, YouTube, or at the Watch Live button on our website. See you next time.